People often ask me, what types of electronics are most susceptible to an EMP? And I like to think of them in three categories. So the first one is anything that contains modern solid state electronics. That's like computers, cell phones, um, televisions, anything that has you know, modern electronics in it, even vehicles, even cars and trucks. Those are susceptible because those electronics have a much lower voltage um, level at which they can be damaged. All right, the second is anything connected to a very long conductor. So a good example of that is anything you plug into the wall, well, you're now connected up through the utility grid to very long conductors. And those long conductors can take in that energy very efficiently and then bring it into the electronic device and cause damage. All right, and then third is anything that has an antenna on it. So a good example of that is like two-way radios or ham radio, even cell phones. Anything that has an antenna is designed to pick up very small signals and amplify them so that you can use them. And of course, if they're trying to pick up very small signals when they get a very large signal like from an EMP, they can easily be damaged. Those front end electronics can easily be damaged. So how do you go about protecting those electronics? If the device is small and doesn't have to be plugged in, you can simply store it away in some kind of uh, conductive enclosure. Now a really convenient way to do it is to use what are called EMP bags or shielded bags. So I have one here from Faraday Defense. And it's a real nice bag. It's got a Velcro top. It's a multi-layer bag, offers you know, excellent shielding. And so what you do is whatever electronics you're worried about, you just simply stuff them in that bag, seal it up and set it away somewhere and they're essentially protected. The, the energy that gets inside those bags is very, very small. Um, there are less expensive ones as well. There's some that kind of look like a Mylar bag. They're not really Mylar, but they're, they're, they look like that. They're a more durable plastic. Um, you can put items in there, you can fold over the top and tape them, or if they're zip top, you can zip them up and then just put them away. All right, so that's a very convenient way to store small scale electronics that don't have to be plugged in or used all the time. All right, so things that are larger, you might make an ad hoc Faraday cage. Maybe you take a big galvanized garbage can um, you line the inside with cardboard if you want so nothing touches that metal and you put your items inside there and you put the lid on. Now the lid is the source of energy uh, leakage. The energy comes up in around the lid. I've measured that a number of times on different channels. Um, so what you want to do is you want to take some kind of conductive gasket and put it around the inside of that, that, that can's lid so that when it seats down on top of the can it seats uh, electrically tight. Okay. By doing that, you can get excellent shielding from those ad hoc Faraday cages like galvanized garbage cans. All right? You can find these, these gaskets uh, at disasterrepair.com, uh, ones that we've tested specifically for those kind of applications. So that's great for medium-sized devices, storing them away in an ad hoc Faraday cage. So again, small devices in some kind of EMP bag, medium-sized devices in a, a Faraday container of some sort, maybe a, a trash can of some sort. And then very large uh, devices, maybe a, a portable generator or even a, a vehicle like a car or a truck, you can get conductive cloth. And I tested a whole bunch of these cloths, uh, one of the YouTube videos, uh, and before we arrived on this one. And again, you can find this cloth at disasterpair.com. But basically what you do is you make that cloth into a giant tarp or cover and you drape it over the item and let the cloth sit on the ground all the way around it. And it does a decent job of shielding it from radiated energy that might come in. Okay, So for freestanding electronics, those are great ways to handle it. Now, not everything is freestanding. Sometimes you have to keep things plugged into the wall and you still want to do something to protect them. All right, so the first thing to know is you start with protection of the whole house. All right? It's just the best place to start because then it offers protection to all the electronics to some degree or another. And you do that with two steps. All right? you First put in a high quality surge protection device out at the main breaker panel. Now I always recommend the Siemens FS140, which is a very good surge protector, but there are other good quality surge protectors on the market too. All right, so you have that wired in at the main breaker panel. And you also install a set of these high saturation ferrites. All right, it typically takes three of them, put one on each of the hot lines and one on the neutral line. Um, and what that does is they help to suppress very fast transients that might come in on those power lines. So between the two, between the surge protection device and the high saturation ferrites, they do a very good job of suppressing like the E1, E2 transients that might come in from a, an EMP. All right, so you start there at the main panel, do some protections to protect the whole house, and then anything else appliance-wise that you're worried about, electronics and appliances, so computers and even maybe refrigerators, things that you just don't want to lose and you have to keep plugged in, 
you can buy these smaller broadband ferrites that just clip around their power cords, okay? So relatively inexpensive. It's a very nice way to add in some form of transient protection to individual items, okay? So again, broadband ferrites, and you can find those at disasterprepare.com as well. All right, and then finally, you might have some cases where you want to protect, let's say, uh, your vehicles, all right? And this could be cars and trucks and even RVs and boats and things like that. And there are a number of products we offer uh, that do that. And it really offers a multi-point protection, which is the way I've always recommended. Um, so what you do is you, you get these transient reducing auxiliary plugs. These are called traps. And they're really nice. They're great quality products. Um, and they just plug in the cigarette lighter, if you want to call it that. It's the receptacle, the 12 volt receptacle of the vehicle. And inside of them is a really fast transient voltage suppression part. So if the voltage gets too large on that, that line, this turns on and shunts that energy away before it can get uh, high enough to damage electronics. So it's a great little product and they're not terribly expensive. Um, there's another version that can be used. It's the same protection device inside, uh, same function of the protection device, um, goes right across the batteries, okay? So if you have one battery in the vehicle, you generally would put this across it. If you have two batteries and they're separated under the hood, like some vehicles have, you really want one on each of the batteries, okay? So again, same protection part inside, uh, a little very, very high speed uh, transient voltage suppression uh, component inside of it, all right? Also a very well-built uh, part. So in terms of vehicles, you do the two traps, the, the regular trap in the cigarette lighter and the battery trap goes across your battery. And then you can get a set of uh, car ferrites, these high saturation car ferrites, very similar to the high saturation house ferrites. And they go around the main battery wires, all right, just to offer some additional transient protection that might couple into those wires and then get distributed everywhere in the car. All right, so those three things are what we recommend for vehicles. And finally, I wanna offer a suggestion that you, you look at getting a device that will help you detect when an EMP has actually occurred, all right? Now, an EMP is a, a gonna happen way, way high in the atmosphere, and so you won't know when it happens. It's not like you're gonna hear it or you're gonna see it. So all you might notice is that you start having things not working properly. Um, you know, it could take some time before you even knew it occurred, and by then, the E3 event of the EMP could have already be damaging things in your home, all right? So you'd like to know as soon as the E1, E2 occurs. And that's what um, this EMP alert does, all right? It has multiple functions and it's pretty clever, it's pretty neat. It detects when an E1, E2 occurs, the radiated burst that occurs in the air. It actually picks up that energy through a little antenna and it detects it and it sounds a brief alarm to say, hey, I, I just received a really powerful burst of electromagnetic energy. You should probably pay attention. All right, and then it monitors the power lines. It's plugged in, so it monitors the power lines, which would not have gone out from E1, E2. They're gonna go out when E3 occurs, when the voltage levels start to rise on those power lines. And when those voltage levels start to rise, it doesn't take much. The EMP alert will start sounding a continuous alarm to say, hey, the voltage levels are no longer within spec. Something's occurring, okay? You need to take action. What action would you take? Well, you'd go out to the main breaker panel and you'd open up your breaker so that it would disconnect your house from the grid, all right? And that would prevent that conducted surge of energy from coming into the home and potentially damaging all kinds of things, all right? So the EMP alert is a really nice early warning device to just tell you that something's off and give you a chance to go out and open the breaker of your house before the E3 surge of current came in and caused damage. So I hope that this was helpful. I tried to just identify the types of products and electronics that might be damaged by an EMP um, as well as some basic protections you can put in place uh, to try and keep them safe. All right, so if you have any questions, feel free to post them down in the comment section. I do my best to keep up with those and provide brief answers, right? To find any of these products or to find out more information on them, just simply go to disasterpreparer.com.